Welcome to my little journey down road testing memory lane and today I'm going to talk about this. This is uh, a bike that my little brother's just bought, GSX-R 1000K, it's actually a K6 but we're going to talk about the K5 because the K5 has just has become an iconic superbike and uh, everyone's got a story about the K5. I actually ran one as a long-term test bike in 2005 and 2006. I raced it every weekend as well as it being a road bike. So I used to take it apart on a Thursday night, go racing, transform it to a race bike, transform it back again. Went all over Europe on it. It's just a fantastic bike. And I'm sure a lot of you out there have got K5 memories. It's won a lot of races um, and this particular bike I mean, this is like uh, rare as rocking horse doo doo because it's a low mileage. My brother's behind the camera, actually. 1,700 miles, isn't it? 1,700 miles. Um, and it's a K6 because you can tell it's a K6. It's got that little uh, turquoise line on the fair in there. And it's got a few little modifications. It's pretty much standard, which is what you want with a, a bike like this. But um, the previous owners put Brembo monoblocks on it. It's put rear sets on it quick shifter and a different seat and probably the best modification is a, a Brembo master cylinder because k has always had spongy brakes. Is that about that Ben? Yeah. Yeah. So as before what I want to talk to you about is the journey the K5 in MCN really and just talk about two issues of MCN. The first one is the K5 launch and little were we to know what an icon it will become. And that was the 16th of uh, 16th of February 2005. That was at Eastern Creek in Australia. And then a month later, we did our first group test. So, you know, when the, the launch happened in Australia, this is kind of peak sports bike or super bike pomp, isn't it? This is when super bikes are really, really important, mainly because people could afford them. I think the the K5 when it came out was less than nine grand. Can you believe that? Um, so people were really interested in, in, in these super bikes and GSX-R thousands historically had always been class winners, even though they were a year behind all the other competitions. So for example, when the K5 came out, it was a year after the R1, Blade and ZX-10R, those new models came out. So it was with great excitement that I flew to Australia as you would anyway and uh, spent a day riding uh, the K5 around Eastern Creek so Suzuki flew us there business class I think those are the days we had Kevin Schwantz there as a sort of brand ambassador and he was out riding with us and this was a really special occasion um, testing it for MCN and, and probably one of the most keenly kind of looked out for tests that we did that year so just to give you an idea of how special the K5 was, I'm going to read a few little uh, things that are in the article. I mean, basically, this bike was lighter, more powerful than the old GSX-R. To ride, it was faster, but fundamentally it was easier as well because it was lighter. And um, it was, yeah, it was just mind-blowing. So if I read out a couple of the specs, so these are the days where... The Japanese manufacturers would fundamentally change their bikes every two years. Nowadays, it's all about minor updates. It's about Euro 5 or whatever, where they change tiny things. But back in the day, they'd change complete engines because they sold so many bikes. And the, the technical presentations were amazing. So I'll read out a few things here, which it will give you an idea of why the GSX-R was such a, an amazing thing. So. So if we start with the engine, we said that the engine's are lighter, more compact, more potent. It's a pinnacle of 20 years of combined GSX-R engine development. So this late, latest version has a slightly wider cylinder bores. So it takes the capacity from 998.6 cc to um, from 988. So that's a pretty big jump. Uh, inside those bores are lighter forged pistons, uh, 32 grams lighter, revised chrome nitride, uh, coated upper and oil scraper piston rings, uh, cylinder head has a larger inlet uh, and exhaust ports, thicker valves, um, 
they're up to 30 mil and 24 mil. The valves are now titanium. Um, and this lightning exercise has allowed the red line to be raised uh, by 1000 RPM to 13,250. Um, and the com smaller combustion chamber gives a compression ratio of 12.5 to one rather than 12. So to cope with all the extra power, so this made a claimed 176 BHP, which was up 11 BHP on last year's model, the K4. Um, its crankshaft and con rods are strengthened. And to stop the big Suzuki getting too hot under the collar at full chat, a new curved radiator with new cooling capacity. So big changes in the engine. Clutch and gearbox, um, for the first time the GSX-R gets a slipper clutch. So, uh, I mean, that's even on shopping bikes now, isn't it? But this is one of the first bikes to have a slipper clutch uh, and a closer ratio gearbox. New fuel injection, dual, f uh, dual valve throttle bodies are now large with 52 mil up two mil bores at inlet side. Um, each throttle body has twin injectors, primary injector working constantly while secondary one chimes in to feed extra fuel at high RPM to prop up the power. Air is force fed into the air box via rem air scoops, those classic scoops. And it goes on, new exhaust. I mean, massive full titanium exhaust. The frame and swing arm, brand new frame, two kilos lighter. Um, the frame itself is six mil shorter, 15 mil narrower, shorter reach to the bars. I mean, these are the days actually where handlebars are right set in like proper clip-ons nowadays are almost like motocross bars, which is reflects the different riding styles now. Um, GSXR brace aluminium swing arm, uh, and the weight was down, like uh, the K4, 168 kilos, um, and this is two kilos lighter, 166 which is 13 kilos lighter than the blade. I mean, those weight figures could sort of be taken with a pinch of salt because they were dry figures. So, you know, there's no way to ever verify them. Uh, new bodywork, reposition ram air ducts, um, inspired by Suzuki Grand Prix bikes, new instruments, new analog taco and digital speedo, gear indicator for the first time. That was the big news back then. Um, we've got, New radial mount calipers, obviously these ones are different. New wheels and the standard tires back then were Bridgestone BT-014. Um, same Kaeba 45 mil upside down forks and rear shock, um, but a new linear eight rear suspension linkage is claimed to give better feedback when you're at the limit. So massive changes for this bike. And um, yeah, our day riding it around Phillip Island was amazing and a massive leap forward to anything else that was uh, around at the time. Um, but the next test is interesting. So what normally happens at MCN is you'll ride the bike at a launch and then the next thing you do with it is pitch it, pitch it against its rivals. So this is again one of the most keenly anticipated group tests that we've done, had, had done at that time. Um, and here we go, this is for some reason, we had a, a yellow and black one. Um, it was the first time I'd ever seen one at the time. So this um, this group test. So first of all, here we go. So we had it up, up against the 04 R1, 04 uh, ZX10R, and the 04 Blade. Like I say, the Suzuki was always a year behind. As it turns out now, this is probably, well, this is Suzuki's best GSX-R really because in the K7 um, had to adhere to Euro rules. So it had a twin exhaust and it was a lot heavier. The engine was a lot peakier and then it kind of fell behind its rivals. And really, I don't think 1000cc group tests have been this important uh, since then because, you know, you do a 1000cc group test now and say a BMW or a Ducati wins, but you're talking 20 grand bikes. So people aren't really gonna buy them. Um, that's me in the pictures, but I'm wearing Trevor Franklin's leathers. So the story behind that is um, that because of a launch schedule, I was already penciled in to ride a Triumph Speed Triple in the south of France. This group test is the south of France as well. Um, so I was a little bit miffed <laughs> that I didn't, wasn't gonna be involved in the thousands test, but that's just one of them things. Um, but what happened, um, the speed triple test and the thousand test was going on at the same time. And Trevor Franklin actually crashed during the, the road part of this thousands test. Wrecked a fire blade. He had to go home. Rob Hoyles, 
had to van down a, a fire blade to replace the one that was crashed. That's how much kind of money was swilling around back then and how important thousands tests were that we just had to get another bike to replace that blade. Um, and I was kind of drafted in a super sub. So once I finished riding the speed triple at the, at the launch in the south of France, I think it was Cannes or something like that, this thousand test was going on in the south of France as well. So I made my way to meet everyone else and I wore Trevor's quite baggy <laughs> Dane Easy leathers for the rest of the test. But it was, it was just amazing. I mean, what, what a thrill it was to ride those four bikes. So, I mean, it won. There's no, uh, no surprise there, but let's give you a few facts and figures about these bikes. I might bring back a few memories. So we dynoed all the bikes. So the GSX-R, this is the blue curve here. Look, it's head and shoulders above all the others. So the Suzuki on, on uh, Mark Bruin's BSD dyno made 159 bhp. ZX10 158.8, Blade 151.4, 1, sorry, ZX10 151.8, Blade 151.4, R1 151.0, so they're all 151 bhp, except for the Suzuki, which is 159, so significantly more, and the same goes with the torque figures, so again, the blue line there had more torque all the way through the revs, and that's what you, you felt that's what you feel when you ride one of these things they've just got so much grunt so 80 um lubfoots of torque for suzuki 76 kawasaki 76 blade and 72 for the revy little r1 um <clears throat> and yeah you, you you just feel those power figures on the road it's just it was just better in every single respect which is probably why it made such a great um super stock bike you didn't really have to do much to it and you know just add water and bosh, off you go, you can win races. And then the other interesting thing was regarding performance figures. So we used to speed test just about every bike that we used to get into MCN. Um, nowadays we don't because really performance figures aren't that important on the kind of bikes we ride today. You know, tall rounders, adventure bikes, nakeds, it doesn't really matter how fast they go, but you know, the super bike days are all about bar room bragging and, uh, you know, who's got the fastest bike. So Bruce Dunn does all of our speed testing um, at Bruntingthorpe. We don't use that anymore because Bruntingthorpe's been turned into a car park, unfortunately. Um, so these were done into a headwind, according to this uh, test. So no surprise, Suzuki is the fastest. So a true 176 mile an hour uh, the standing quarter uh, is isn't the best uh, so it's a 1045 and 145 mile an hour what beats it there the r1 gets there quicker and it's got a higher top speed so the r1's actually got a better standing quarter um the 0 to 60 the gsxr was the best 3.1 seconds the others are 3.2 r1 3.3 just because it's so peaky the braking from 70 to zero tests and um, 50 meters for the suzuki 50 for the kawasaki the blade was best under braking basically because it's so long it doesn't endo and it's got really good brakes as well that's 49 meters and the yamaha 50 so they're really close there um, and this other figure is quite uh, revealing so top gear roll on from 40 to 80 so sixth gear 40 mile an hour crack the throttle and then it's the time taken to get to 80. So because the Suzuki's so light and so grunty, it did it in the quickest time. 4.7 seconds. Then the Kawasaki, 5.7. That's a second slower. The Blade, 6.6, .6, nearly two seconds slower. I mean, that's like asthmatic, isn't it? Um, and the R1, 5.3. And then the same top gear roll on from 40 to 120. The Suzuki's the best, nine seconds. 11 for the Kawasaki, 13 for the Blade. Wow, that's massive, isn't it? And nine for the R1. So the R1's obviously getting, it's coming on cam and it's going. So unsurprisingly, the uh, Suzuki wins the test, as we all know. Um, what did we say in our verdict? We said it's a new class leader. Um, regardless of whether you're on road or track, going fast or slow, the new GSX-R1000 is a big step ahead of the competition. 
Last year's group test winner, the R1, is the runner-up here. While it still impresses thanks to its superb build quality, styling, speed and smoothness, it's disappointing on track when compared with the Suzuki. The Honda is third, handling both road and track duties with ease and confidence, but it just lacks the fun factor of the other three bikes. However, it's the joint cheapest here with the Suzuki. The superb ZX-10R brings up the rear. This aggressive green machine is the weapon of choice on the track and for going bonkers on the road, but it's too single-minded for many riders and can be intimidating for some. The GSX-R1000 manages to combine the best bits of all the other bikes and then some. It doesn't just win this test, it absolutely walks it. So there you go. And then uh, there's uh, the rating. The also new GSX-R1000 rules the Superbike Roost. Not only is it the best to ride both on the road and track, it's also the joint cheapest bike here. And we've got Suzuki first, Yamaha second, Honda third, Kawasaki fourth. And then the kind of the good and bad points of each bike. The Suzuki, more power and better handling than the 04 bike, but not as well built as the R1 or Fireblade. Well, I'd agree with that now. Um, the R1, smooth, sexy, very fast, top build quality. Uh, and we've said the sh and we've said the soft rear shock limits it. And we've said the soft rear shock limits it on the track. A bit bouncy. And the Honda Fireblade, superb all rounder hand. The Honda Fireblade, superb all rounder handling gives confidence, but it carries too much weight to live with the GSXR on the track. And then finally, the Kawasaki ZX-10R. It's raw, aggressive and loads of fun, but too single-minded to be a great all-rounder. So, you know, that's, that's the story of the K5. And we all know, well, you know, when we go, when we ever re-ride these things again, they're just, they're, they're amazing, even by today's standards. You know, they're, they're free of ABS, free of traction control, free of anti-wheelie. They're free of Euro sound deadening. They're just raw super bikes, but not, not angry raw super bikes, just really beautifully balanced, lovely smooth raw super bikes. So with any luck, Ben will let me have a go on this one day. All right, Ben? Yeah. <laughs> um, and we'll see if um, sort of the memories um, live up to reality. They say you should never meet your heroes, but I think this is a hero that's well worth revisiting. If you were ever lucky enough to get your hands on GSX-R1000 K5 or K6, there's two things you could do with it. You could either make sure it's completely standard and have it completely faithful to what it was like in 2005 or 2006. Or if you actually want to ride it and enjoy it, there's a few kind of well-chosen tweaks you could do to it just to kind of bring it up to modern standards. And to be honest, on the road or even on the track, that would keep up with a modern superbike. Now modern superbikes have got 200 horsepower, but then they need a load of electronics to rein it back in again. So the first big improvement you can make is, is tires. So like I said before, it came on Bridgestone BT-014s, but the sizes back then, it had a 190-50 profile. So that was a really flat profile tire. And obviously over the years, the profile, they have 190-55s or 255s. So if you were to stick um, sticky tires on this with a bigger balloon shape, then you would get you get more grip, obviously, and you get nicer steering as well. The other small little things would be to um, get a fork kit and a rear shock, and that will help it steer even better. That will improve the ride quality. That would just make it lighter feeling and more enjoyable to ride. And then probably the final thing is what this bike's already got is sorting the brakes out because the brakes do fade. Um, even modern GSX-Rs fade, but then you get an extra kick in the teeth because the ABS is really intrusive as well. So, you know, a good master cylinder, even standard calipers are still good, but an aftermarket master cylinder, decent pads, braided lines, and then you've got still one of the best super bikes around. So thank you very much for watching. Keep those questions coming in and I'll see you soon.